This line is now muted. This conference will now be recorded. For a menu of available commands, press star 1. There are 31 participants in the conference. Well, we'll be launching the core competencies for State Flex Program Excellence. This is work that's been going on over the past year with many stakeholders involved, including the State Flex Program. And so we're really excited to share this information with you today. First, we'd like to provide a few updates from the Technical Assistance and Services Center, our task the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and the FLEX monitoring team. So first, a few things to share on behalf of TAF. A reminder that each state FLEX program is being asked to complete a state FLEX profile online. The deadline for completion of this is Friday, March 18th. And this is a way for you to showcase your work, to see examples from other programs, and for the public, including national and state stakeholders, to see your excellent work as well. It's great preparation for content that you'll be putting into your FLEX non-competing continuation grant. Uh, and it's just an excellent opportunity, I think, to share the work that you're doing. Last year, all 45 states completed the State FLEX program, so we'd really like to see a repeat again this year. And the profile can com be completed online at ruralcenter.org front slash TSC. If you have any questions, please reach out to anyone at TAS to assist you. The FLEX non-competing continuation comes out next week, and TASC is here to support you with technical assistance and any questions that you may have for updating and completing your FLEX NCC. We're also available to review the grant components that you complete before submitting them. We ask that each state, if they are going to ask us to review a portion, just choose one section for TASC to assist with. So for example, you could choose your performance narrative or your work plan or even um, your position descriptions, if you so choose. Please submit that component to TAS prior to March 2nd so that we can have adequate time to review before all of the NCC submissions are due on May 16th. So we'd ask you to turn those into us by May 2nd before they're due on May 16th. If you have an earlier internal deadline that you need feedback by, um, please account for that when you send it to us. And we ask that you allow us at least three business days to review the content. We'll respond with any comments or suggestions we have, but we're not going to rewrite the content for you. Um, it's highly suggested that the state programs review the federal grant writing mail manual available on the TAS website for tips and suggestions about grant writing. And again, please reach out to us with any questions that you may have as you're working on the NCC. The Flex Coordinator Manual is a document that we update here at TAS annually, and this year it's undergoing a major update. We're removing any duplication with this newly released core competencies for State Flex Program Excellence Guide. And so the Flex Coordinator Manual will be retitled Flex Program Fundamentals in an introduction to the rural, uh, Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Program. It's going to be uh, condensed and shortened in length um, and streamlined a lot more, but it will still be released online and a paper version will be mailed out to each program. We anticipate the release of this Flex Coordinator Manual, again, retitled into the Flex Program Fundamentals on April 1st. There's a virtual knowledge group call coming up on rural value models on March 28th. Um, and the call, or the webinar, will be discussing um, the Bridge to Value Framework, the application of this framework to rural areas, and updates that you're seeing in the field from your state and critical access hospitals working on transitions. The webinar will be recorded, and we're really looking for your discussion and participation on that webinar. There's also an MD Equip virtual knowledge group on March 31st. Uh, we've extended the deadline for the photo contest in Rural Route, the electronic newsletter. If you'd like to submit a rural relevant or flex relevant photo to participate in the contest, please email your photo to Kayla Murphy Sign at cmurphy, C-M-U-R-P-H-Y, at ruralcenter.org by close of business tomorrow. Caleb, Caleb will then upload the photos into Flex Program Forum for people to vote on um, through March 23rd, and then the um, winning submissions will be profiled then beginning in the March edition of Rural Route. So we're really looking forward to your participation in this and just kind of a fun way to connect. Another fun way to connect um, is a book club discussion. Some of you may remember the book club program that TAS uses support, so we're kind of revitalizing that in a different method. Um, we're looking for those that are interested in participating to um, purchase or borrow a book on your own, um, and then participate in the discussion in the FLEX program forum. 
The first book that was selected for the book club discussion is The Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living by Dr. Amit Sood. Um, so you can access that book either through your local library or an online source or order it directly. Um, and so right now we're just kind of looking in the forum to get information about who's interested in participating. Um, and so then we can set some kind of goals going forward about when we'll start the discussion and what pieces we'll start talking about first. So if you're interested in participating, um, please note that in the forum. Or if you have any questions, uh, reach out to Caleb as he's kind of uh, orchestrating the book club discussion. So with that, um, those are the updates that I wanted to be sure to share from Cass. Um, and I'd like to now turn things over to Kevin Cheney and Sarah Young with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy to talk about their updates, including a critical access hospital regulatory update. Uh, Kevin and Sarah, it is star two to unmute your line. Thanks, Tracy. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so I have just a couple of quick updates. Um, and one of those being for those of you who had submitted carryover requests, hopefully yours are in because we're now well past the deadline. Um, we've got a couple we're still kind of shooting back and forth, but that's because you've got them fortunately in before the deadline. Um, some of you have already started asking, when are we going to see our updated notices of award um, with these carryover funds? And well, I'm hoping to get back with all of you with a little bit more updated information um, as far as the possible timeline of, of what that might actually look like. So um, stick tight. Uh, a reminder that next week um, an EHB, the non-competing non continuation, will be made available in EHB. Um, next Monday I'll be sitting out some information just prior uh, to the release of the non-competing continuation, which will be Tuesday of next week. And then after you have about a week to kind of go in, look at it, and digest the information that we send out, uh, we're going to be having a webinar on the 23rd to kind of walk through what's being required in the non-competing continuation, what it looks like, um, especially if there are any, uh, since we do certainly have some new flex coordinators and this will be your first time going through it, uh, but hopefully this will also be an opportunity to kind of help calm some of the fears or, you know, what is it that they're asking for, how many uh, pages am I going to have to work to, to type up, and hopefully you'll be seeing a, a fewer amount, but also um, really looking at using this as a really great opportunity to provide um, a programmatic update to the office, and it's also an opportunity uh, to adjust and kind of see where are things currently based on where we thought they would be when we wrote our, you know, three-year work plan over a year ago. Um, so this will be uh, an opportunity for you to work with your project officer because this is a non-competing continuation uh, and also an opportunity for you to reach out and, as Tracy mentioned earlier, to uh, get some assistance from TASC if you uh, choose to do so. Um, and I would highly encourage you to take advantage um, of those, especially, you know, if you kind of realize, hmm, there's some areas in which we could certainly be working on maybe identifying you know, baseline data or even thinking about, you know, is there an actual uh, outcome maybe that we're trying to work towards. So just some things to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, the non-competing continuations then are due um, by mid-May, so May 16th. Um, so you have a time period to, to fill those out. Um, this goes actually pretty well in line also with your flex uh, profiles being sent to task. So um, certainly one can easily be transferable into the, the other, so uh, please fill those out. Um, people do go to the TASC website actually a lot. It's one of the most visited uh, areas, and they, they certainly take a look at the FLEX uh, profile. So um, don't scrimp on information there. Uh, let's see if I've got anything else off the top of my head. I can't think of anything. Uh, hopefully some of you did get a email reminder from FMT that they'll be unveiling their Compass system uh, this Friday. Um, I'll look to see if it was sent off the flex coordinators list, and I will try to resend that at the end of today just to make sure that everybody gets it. Um, they'll be having a recorded webinar on how to use this system, which we hope to uh, be integrating more and more with our flex program. So I'm going to stop there uh, with our um, Updates. Uh, we we do have a quick question. I see around the sideboard from Catherine. Kevin, are we okay to work on carryover projects 
knowing the money is coming, or do we need to wait for the NGA to be assured we have the funds? Let me get back to you on that. So let me see what Hertz's policy is, and I will certainly get back. Okay. okay. And if Nicole would flip to the next slide, this is Sarah Young, and I'll do a quick policy review of some of the more relevant things. We're trying to change the format of the policy updates on these task 90s a little bit to really keep the specific policies that I talk about, ones that are highly relevant to critical access hospitals and the FLEX programs. Um, if you participate in the NOSOR policy call or review the policy updates that are in every month's um, rural route uh, newsletter from TASC, you'll see that those updates include much longer um, and more detailed updates about more different regulations and rules that have been published. And so if you want everything, go there. Um, for the policy updates on the Task 90, I'm going to limit it to the most call relevant ones so that we can be time efficient. So that said, I've got four bullet points that I wanted to highlight this quarter. The biggest one that I'm sure many of you have been paying attention to already is the revised survey and certification guidance for cause that was issued February 12th by CMS. And I want to emphasize that that was a survey and certification memo from the CMS central office to the regional offices. It's nothing that a um, state office or a flex or a cause staff person needs to fill out. The CMS regional offices will use that document in their own assessment of a cause necessary provider status. Um, if you have any specific questions about the contents of that memo, please feel free to contact me. Of note, it, it significantly expands the types of allowable documentation that a CA can use to prove it was designated as a necessary provider by its state on or before December 31st, 2005. Let me make sure I said that date right, 2005. Um, when the necessary provider um, designation rule sunset. Um, so another question that I know has come up and that the survey and cert people at CMS Central Office have addressed is that cause will be, the regional offices will assess that um, necessary provider documentation and status when calls come up on their regular recertification survey cycle for the CMS survey process. However, you can also proactively reach out to your regional office and ensure that your documentation is up to date if you want to do so. And that can be done at any time. Um, a couple of other significant rules that are out right now. Um, the proposed rule, which would change the benchmark methodology for the Medicare Shared Savings Program, is open for public comment, and comments are due March 28th. As a reminder, that is the um, major accountable care organization program through CMS. It is one of the programs of the Innovation Center. And um, how the benchmarks are set in the shared savings program significantly impacts how all participants, um, including cause and other hospitals, calculate potential shared savings that they might gain through participating in the ACO program. Um, just Monday, we received an announcement that applications for funding in the Accountable Health Communities model to CMS. The deadline was extended to May 18th. It was previously, applications were previously due in mid-March, but due to the high level of interest, CMS extended the application deadline to May 18th. And then finally, the comprehensive care for joint replacement model, which the final rule was published the end of 2015, starts its performance period April 1st. As a reminder, that was a, um, bun that's a bundled payment model specifically for um, 
orthopedic surgeries for hip and knee replacement that is mandatory in the 67 metropolitan statistical areas that were designated in the final rule. So this is the first time that a CMS model, participation in a CMS payment model has been mandatory in certain regions. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but um, I am available, as you all know, to answer policy questions if you have them. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Kevin. Now we'd like to welcome Alex Stevenson from the University of Minnesota with the Flex Monitoring Team to share an update about um, Flex Monitoring Team's work. Alex, it is star two to unmute your line. I can hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm with the Flex Monitoring Team. Task asked me to provide a quick update on what our researchers have been up to since the last call in November. Um, I've just got a few things here. I'll go through them chronologically. Uh, so since the last call in November, we've released 47 research publications. Uh, one of those is a policy brief uh, by our my colleagues in Maine, uh, CA Relevant Measures for Health System Development and Population Health. Uh, Forty-five of them are state-specific reports, which present CA reporting and performance data on HCAPs for the period of April 2014 through March 2015. Uh, one of them, the last one is a national summary HCAPs report for the same period of time, and all of these uh, along with all of our publications are available on our website for download uh, flexmonitoring.org. Uh, last week, uh, we launched our new online data query system, Compass, uh, to state flex coordinators only. Um, as Kevin mentioned, we're going to be hosting a tutorial webinar this Friday afternoon uh, for state flex coordinators and flex program staff. We sent out access info to that yesterday. So if you're a state flex coordinator, you should have um, received all of the uh, the access information um, and just contact uh, me if you haven't not yet gotten that. Um, next week we're planning to send out Compass login credentials to all individual CAS um, and we are also the same week anticipating we'll release our next policy brief which uh, focuses on reducing readmissions and critical access hospitals. Um, we just received the suppressed hospital compare data from CMS last week, and we're working to complete our analysis of all of that and produce and release the state-level quality reports as quickly as we possibly can, hoping to get those out uh, later this month. Sometimes the review uh, approval process pushes that back a little bit. It might be early April, um, but we're working hard to turn that around as quickly as we can. And lastly, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting any new FLEX program staff at the Task FLEX Coordinator Orientation in April. We'll talk a little bit about uh, using our products for quality improvement and just giving a, some background about the FLEX monitoring team. Thanks, Alex. It looks like there's a question for you oh, in the chat. Uh, well, FLEX coordinators have logins to, log to cause as well. Uh, I would imagine you could have them, but Jill, but uh, your the flex coordinator login provides you access to all of the individual cause in your state. Um, the only difference between your access level and the individual CA level is that if you log in as an individual CA, you'll only be able to see identifiable data for that one CA. Everything else pops up as hospital. X, Y, or Z, whereas if you log in as, as a state flex coordinator, you would be able to see the identifiable data for all of the cause in, in your case, Arizona. So um, we would Can you hear me? Fine. We'd be fine with providing you with the individual cause login info, but I don't think it would be very useful to you since you already have that info. Can you hear me? I can. Um, the reason I asked that is because there's a lot of turnover and, and some of the folks had come to me when you did mail them their yes. access code. Good point. Yeah. It's easy to provide. Yep. We can okay. provide you with that login info. Um, I always have all of the 
um, all this stuff at hand. And so you can contact me at any time if you don't want to worry about keeping it filed away or whatever I, I've got. Okay. That sounds okay. good. Yeah, thanks for asking. Any other questions for Alex? Star two to unmute your line. Great. Well, thank you, Alex. Yep, thanks. All right, so at this time, we're really pleased to share with you today a guide, assessment, and a web page of resources to support the core competencies for State Flex Program Excellence. Um, many of you may be familiar with TASC, but we're a program in the National Rural Health Resource Center. We're funded through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and the center is a nonprofit that's dedicated to sustaining and improving health care uh, in rural communities across the country. The things that we'd like to cover today and share with you include the nine core competencies that are associated with State Flex Program Excellence, review the materials that were developed to support the competencies, including an assessment, and have you hear from State Flex Program peers about why the competencies are important to their program. So back in May of 2015, with funding from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, TAF brought together experienced flex coordinators and directors to aid in identifying what a framework of these competencies could look like. So displayed on the screen are a list of the summit participants, and they include representation from across the country, and also included, of course, the flex monitoring team and the federal office of rural health policy. At the summit, we sought to develop a framework of flex coordinator strategies, core competencies, and resources for achieving excellence in state flex programs. We sought to identify and discuss the most important skills and methods necessary for state flex programs and coordinators to support critical access hospitals in their communities through a successful transition to value-based payments and population health management. And the group also provided recommendations to assist in developing and maintaining these competencies and knowledge uh, going forward. So the following information will describe more on the nine core competencies that were identified. A very important note is that these nine core competencies were vetted by the state flex programs at large at the 2015 flex program reverse site visits. And the nine core competencies are displayed on your screen, and I will read through them. Uh, they include managing the FLEX program, building and sustaining partnerships, improving processes and efficiencies, understanding policies and regulations, promoting quality reporting and improvements, supporting high hospital financial performance, addressing community health needs, understanding systems of care, and preparing for future models of health care. It's also extremely important to keep in mind that these nine core competencies are for state flex programs at the organizational level. They are not intended for the individual level. Therefore, the organization should review its proficiency in these competencies with its internal resources, but also external resources such as partners or subcontractors. Additionally, we feel that these nine core competencies don't necessarily have a hierarchy to them, that they're all uh, equally important to a successful, well-rounded program. So Kevin Cheney from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy will now describe for us um, ORHP's perspective on the competencies. Kevin? Thanks, Tracy. Um, so just a couple, you know, quick words. Is, um, I was very fortunate to sit in, I think it was last May or, or April, and I was still fairly green, um, new, um, and so it was just an excellent opportunity for me to sit and listen to a lot of really, as Tracy mentioned, well-seasoned uh, flex programs talk about both the good things that their programs are doing as well as the challenges that they experience um, and some of the things that they work really hard on to always try to, you know, improve. And then uh, working through, in a sense, you know, well, what are the components of the FLEX program? What are the components in which your FLEX program office, you know, how does it align with those FLEX programs and the kind of uh, the skills, competencies, you've, uh, you know, as, as we're calling it, that 
a program would need, um, you know, kind of in order to make sure that they're doing a good job. Um, and what are those areas? You know, and kind of creating a, a list of buckets, you know, so, so nine kind of buckets or core areas in, in which a program could certainly look at and see, you know, how am I, how is our program doing? Is that an area in which we could um, improve upon? And so that's kind of the whole purpose around the, uh, the assessment and then ultimately the creation and the development and creation and identification of these areas is really, you know, one of the things I seen, you know, coming in was how do we make sure that our flex, you know, grantee programs are, are well rooted. Um, meaning that if turnover were to happen or if something were to happen that, you know, the beat still moves on and without having to try to rebuild a bunch of capacity, which we know does tend to happen. So what can we do to help place our flex grantee programs in the best position to really thrive? And I think for me one of the exciting things is, you know, is some of these may seem, oh, well, very intuitive, like, duh. Uh, but the reality is, is then, well, how do we identify then which one is it and then actually taking maybe some steps to start working towards it and then for us as a program from the federal office side and working with our partners and even our flex coordinators is then identifying what are the resources, best practices, tools in which we can help compile and place in these buckets to then help your program uh, improve and ultimately we want all of our grantees to have really strong high performing grant programs. Um, so. What that will mean is you're reaching out to your critical access hospitals and ultimately having an impact on uh, individuals living in rural areas. And so this is certainly part of that first kind of step in process. And um, excitingly, too, for me is, uh, you know, one of the things Tracy also mentioned earlier was kind of leaning down the flex coordinator manual. And uh, part of this approach that we're taking is trying to help chunk it out into buckets um, and streamline everything. So, uh, and hopefully this will make it a little bit easier for flex programs to also kind of grasp what are some, you know, concrete areas in which we can slowly start to, to work at improving upon. Uh, you can go ahead and click on over to the next slide, Tracy. Um, and so this is one of my favorite pictures um, that, that I took and it's, you know, kind of the winding path. And one of the key things that I'm going to hammer whether it be on this webinar or others, is that um, this is a process. I nor others, you know, we're not expecting uh, to have, you know, you know, huge magnitudes of change o overnight. And uh, little by little, you know, you your your program uh, can shift, identify areas in which you might. Uh, might need some improvement or an area which you could build some capacity from a program perspective your, yourself. And so um, it's just a reminder that, you know, it's a process. Uh, you certainly can work with your project officer. Uh, you can work with task um, and ultimately hopefully come back and help us, let us know. You know, we identified something in this bucket area here um, that really worked well for our program and we'd like to share it so other flex programs could also benefit from it. And we've already had a lot of that. and. Um, you know, and so sending out a, a thank you to some of those programs that have certainly uh, have lended uh, some of the tools and resources that they've done, but certainly that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to do it that might be more applicable to another state that's similar to you. So, um, so just kind of keep that in mind, and this all ties back together as you're putting together your non-competing continuations. What are the good things that are you doing? What are some of the things maybe you could work on for, you know, kind of self-assessment and evaluation? Uh, for your own flex program, uh, but then also sharing it with us and what what are, what are the good things that you're working on. So uh, I will stop there and, and let the show continue on, but uh, just remember, uh, little by little, one travels far. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Kevin. So we'd like for you now to hear from some of the summit participants about the core competencies and their perspective on them. Uh, some of the summit participants were not available to participate in the webinar today, so in some instances, TAS will share with you our thoughts. So what I'm going to do is ask the different summit participants uh, to introduce who you are, for a program you're with, what the competency is, and why it's important to your FLEX program. So first, I'd like to invite Catherine Miller to join the, car, the call, and Catherine, it's star two to unmute your line. Okay, am I good to go? Go ahead. 
Okay, excellent. Um, well, thanks for asking me to speak to give a little bit of perspective. I was very excited and pleased to be part of the summit um, and learn from other programs and get to share my opinion. Um, so it was very, very valuable. And I do want to say overall that um, I'm glad to see these competencies because, um, as we all know, when we started in Flex and maybe that first conference that you went to, um, you probably had the deer in the headlights look and thought, well, you know, what am I getting into? And I, I think I remember saying that to whoever was sitting next to me. And now I'm hearing that from, you know, new flex coordinators. Um, it can be really overwhelming. And I think this is going to give um, all of us a lot of perspective on um, really the different core areas of the program and the many things that, um, you know, loosely we're asked to be experts in. But, you know, that's not altogether true. You know, you can rely on your partners, you can reply, rely on other flex uh, coordinators, or HP, task, etc. And so that's one thing to keep in mind for anybody new who's on the call today, that we have so many resources and it, it really can make things easier um, to understand. So specifically to managing the flex program, I think grant management is so key key because there are so many moving parts and so many components to FLEX, and you can see that when you look at the list of competencies. So tracking your FLEX activities um, in each of the core areas, um, now we're really getting a push to be strong on outcomes, outputs, uh, PIMS, tracking those throughout, throughout the year. So when PIMS comes due, we have those at our fingertips. We don't have to frantically search around. And then other things that aren't necessarily in the grant, too, that we have to manage our time, and that's making time for technical assistance to our hospitals and perhaps clinics, EMS providers, any advocacy that your office might do, keeping up on any changes in regulations, disseminating information, and not to mention taking, you know, between two and four months sometimes to actually put together the grant and write it. So I think it's vital to have a grant management system, whatever that looks like in your office. Um, we use an access database in our office, and we've been using that for one or two years now, and it's just been a blessing. Um, what that does for us is it holds all of our activities important due dates or milestones, things we have to accomplish in each activity so we don't lose track of those. Um, it also lets us track our out outcomes and outputs and PIMS data as we go along throughout the year. And it also tracks contacts for each hospital and which hospitals are involved in which flex activities so we can very quickly look that up if we have some questions. And what you use for your system um, I think is whatever fits you the best. Um, I know some people rely on um, TrueServe um, for some of this. Um, we also use TrueServe, but I don't use that for grant management per se. Um, a, kind of a funny story is what I started with was an Excel database that had each month what I had to do for each activity or each responsibility as a flex coordinator. And I think when I printed it out, I had about 15 legal size sheets and put it together like a puzzle on my back wall. And eventually it just fell off the wall and stayed there because it was just too frustrating to turn around and look at all I had to do. And that was not a format that worked for me. Um, but some people work better off of paper than others. Um, and then just lastly, um, one success we have is meeting weekly, um, and we call it kind of a milestone meeting, where we look at the database and look at what's coming up and what's due, and do that in a team setting so it doesn't all have to fall on me as flex coordinator so we can divide responsibilities um, based on who has time and who has the expertise. So that's what I wanted to say about managing the flex program. Thank you, Catherine. Caleb, I'd like to invite you to join the call. Uh, Caleb murphy Syme is with the National Rural Health Resource Center now, but um, at the time of the summit was the FLEX coordinator in Colorado, and he's going to talk to us about building and sustaining partnerships. Caleb, it's star two to unmute your line. Can you hear me, Tracy? Yes, I can. All right. 
Um, yeah, so I participated as the Flex Program Coordinator for Colorado, and one of the things that I think we did really well, one of the many things I think we did really well, well, not just while I was there in Colorado, was to, to communicate and to work with partner organizations. Um, we worked with the, it was the Southeastern Colorado Area Health Education Center on a big grant that we had for our eye care program. We worked with um, many of our community partners. We worked with our QIO at the time and then what became our QIN to provide webinars between our, with the QIN to provide webinars to our critical access hospitals, primarily focused on quality improvement, but that also morphed into um, immunization strategies and things like that. Um, it was a great opportunity. Um, we also had quarterly meetings with many of the state um, entities that had a, had an interest in quotes in the, the goings on with the critical access hospitals. The hospital association participated in those meetings. The regional um, CMS staff participated in those meetings. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment participated in that meeting in many different aspects. The people who the the people who facilitated the CA um, surveys participated in those meetings, and that was a really, really great opportunity to find out what type of um, types of things they were seeing with the um, with the with the cause during surveys. If they're all um, you know having issues with X, Y, or Z, then we can formulate um, information to go out to the critical access hospitals um, to help with that education. Um, any EMS issues, they also participated. They also had people participating from their EMS organizations or the, the designation of their trauma certification. That was a great opportunity. Um, so there were many aspects that that meeting itself was really beneficial for to kind of find out what's going on. Different people have different relationships with each cause, so you're going to, um, with each critical access hospital, so you're going to hear, hear something from the hospital association or from the surveying entity that you're not going to hear as the, as the flex coordinator, which is really great. Um, and then you're able to bring some of that information and resource requests back, um, back to the office, the primary care office, also participated in those meetings. So if we, we had, um, in our office, we had um, recruitment and retention services. So if a clinic or a hospital out in somewhere was trying to, trying to recruit a provider, but they didn't have their HIPAA designation um, completed, or for a long time there weren't, they were not, re, uh, creating new HIPSAs or the, the process was slow. Getting that update and knowing what was going on was very, very helpful for our recruitment and retention. Um, it also helps just for, um, I guess, uh, what am I trying to think of? It helps demonstrate to the critical access hospitals that you are part of the, part of the network that is there to help assist. Um, when I first got there, sometimes when we would go on a site visit, it would be called, the people from the state are here. And sometimes that's the case if your state office is part of the state, but we were an independent nonprofit and we're not a surveying entity. We're not here to, to you know, to facilitate a survey. We're just here to, to help do this or that. And understanding that was a, a great thing for the cause. Um, I think that's most of what I have to say for building and sustaining partnerships. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to invite Karen Madden from the New York Flex Program 
she's the director there to talk about um, how, oh, I'm, excuse me, I'd actually like to re-invite Catherine to join the call again to talk about improving processes and efficiencies um, from her perspective in Wisconsin. Okay, so that's cool. I got nervous when you introduced Karen. I thought maybe I prepared the wrong section, so that's good. Um, so improving processes and efficiencies. Um, the theme here goes back to managing the FLEX program in my first section there. Um, because again, the theme is that FLEX is a moving machine and it has so many parts. You know, and what you plan in March when you're writing the grant um, may not be possible or may have changed in some way by the time you implement in September. Uh, your hospital's needs have, may have changed. Um, resources in your office may have changed. Maybe you have new staffing or somebody's left recently. Um, same in hospitals, turnover. Same with contractors. You may have contracted a project out or hoped to and something changed in that organization. So you're constantly needing to, um, you know, look at things and look at what's changed and look at how to make things better. Because um, sometimes when you do carry out an initiative, you discover that it hasn't had the impact you thought it would, or it's not as effective, or again, things have changed and you need to move a different direction. So um, an example of this I could point to is that for a few years now, we've uh, looked at a rural stroke, uh, rural hospital stroke improvement project where we try to sign on hospitals to enter data and get with the guidelines and online reporting system so they can look to improve their stroke measures. And I thought especially um, with the direction FLEX is going in and looking at stroke, STEMI, and trauma initiatives in the EMS area, this was particularly something we should continue because we can get some nice uh, data on stroke one and stroke eight and turn that around um, you know, as a PIMS measure, as something that we can look to that, that we did good with the measures. But what we discovered is um, in trying to set up initial webinars to get hospitals on board, we just weren't having people answer with dates of availability, and we just didn't know what does that mean. Does that mean there's no interest here? Um, they just don't have the time to commit. Um, there is interest, but again, time is a factor. Did we pick bad dates? You know, what is it? So this is something that, because we don't know, it's something we have to relook at and uh, really reach out to our hospitals more of a one-on-one -on -one and see if there is interest in this project or if our funding is better spent elsewhere or if the project we're proposing is too time intensive or it's not interesting or not what they're looking for. So um, really in included in improving processes and, effect and efficiencies is not just in your office, but it's also including your hospitals and what they need and not, as we all know, not assuming we know what they need, but really including them in on planning. So some of our keys to Continuous improvement, like I said, is including hospitals, including stakeholders, um, other key organizations that work with rural hospitals, um, and also internally weekly staff meetings and kind of a bit of an evaluation process looking at our office efficiencies and what we can be doing better. And lastly, um, sharing best practices is key, um, encouraging your hospitals to do that, but also doing that from office to office. So that's calls like this, um, being involved in on these as they come up, trying to join the calls live as opposed to recordings is useful so you can bounce things off of other people. Um, definitely things like the reverse site visit um, and then national or, or state venues where you can see others that you work with in your state or on a national level and also be connecting with the hospitals and the other stakeholders that you help. Thanks, Catherine. Those are really excellent examples that you shared. So now I'd like to invite uh, Karen Madden, who's the director of the FLEX program in New York, to talk about the importance of understanding policies and regulations with her program. Karen, it's star two to unmute your line. Thank you. I was. It was funny because you introduced me before, and I was 
unmuting my line and I missed something and then all of a sudden Catherine was talking, so I was very confused. But um, <laughs> all right, well, I'm good. I'm good now. <laughs> Um, thank you for um, both inviting me to participate in the, the group that we had last May and in today's call. Understanding policies and regulations um, is really important for, for our FLEX program in New York and I think really for everyone because um, whereas the, the previous speaker spoke about kind of managing a FLEX program at the state level, I think that understanding policies and regulations is more about supporting our hospitals more on a, a grassroots level so that we can understand the policies and regs and be able to um, assess the impact for each of them and then explain it to them if, if we need to. Um, that's especially true right now in, in the re recertification process. I know um, we've got a few hospitals in New York that are affected by that and I'm sure everyone, everyone else has, has that as well. So it's very important that we understand um, both both what that policy is, um, why it is, and how we can help our hospitals be able to deal with it. Um, and I think you know there's two bullets here: one, policies affecting rural health and regulations affecting rural health, but they're really both um, you know the, the, the same thing. Um, and in the, the session that we had last May. We thought we had, you know, these these were different. These were their own um, buckets, if you will, for a long time, and we had a big discussion about combining them because they they really, at least from my perspective, are are um, very close to, to being the same thing. So whether it's policies at the federal level or the state level or regulations at the state or federal level, I, I just again not to not, not to be too repetitive, but it's just important that we are able to understand them so that um, we're, under, we're able to help our hospital deal with them effectively. Um, I think we're very fortunate in being able to receive a lot of information about policies and regulations without having to do too much too much work um, between the information that TAF gives us with, with what no source policy and flex committees do with um, the Rural Health Information Hub and their newsletters. You know, we've got a lot of information coming out of but it's, um, it's done in a way that it's not overwhelming and it's easy to understand. And um, I think in addition to that, when, when we hear from other states talking about how they're interpreting policies and regulations and what they're doing in their states to um, help their hospitals and, and all of their providers is helpful as well. So that's. Well, that's all I have for that. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to invite Michelle Hoffman from the Wyoming Flex Program to talk about her perspective um, with the competency of promoting quality reporting and improvement. Michelle, it's star two to unmute your line. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Hoffman from the Wyoming Office of Rural Health, and um, I'm happy to share how our office supports the core competency of promoting quality reporting and improvement. Um, this is important to our state program as quality improvement drives the majority of our activities for FLEX. Um, just as an example, some of the things that we do, um, each month we host a quality improvement roundtable. One month it will be a generalized discussion providing updates on QHI, and quick reminders or updates, reporting dates, things like that, new tools. Um, and then the next month will be a focused discussion. So like in February, we had a focused discussion on ED transfer. We used the, um, the, the latest um, data that we had from ED transfer for all the hospitals that participated. And we chose the poor performer, which was in Wyoming at that time was number six. And so we held a, and the entire discussion for that date was held on improvements for this measure and then how, how one CH that is, um, how they are, how, who, who does a, a well, who does good in that measure and how, and they've made improvements, what they did, you know, and share their best practice of what they did to help the others, the other Wyoming hospitals make improvements in that measure. So then this next month, we'll have another generalized discussion, but we've kind of chosen to use, um, uh, We've chosen how to utilize the Stratus ED transfer tool, collection tool, and, and QHI, 
and how to generate and pull reports for those um, hospitals that use QHI. And then the next one will be another ED transfer focus measure and are the, on another poor performer, and that was measure four and five for Wyoming. So, you know, we, what we do is we also conduct a needs assessment annually to the quality improvement personnel from the CAHs each year. We want to make sure that our activities align with um, what um, they need, so we make sure that we meet the needs of the CAH. So we created listservs, a monthly newsletter now, a quality improvement website that has all sorts of um, tools and resources, information on MBQIP and QHI and a QHI or a QI calendar. We use the data from FMT, um, QHI, MBQIP. We analyze that for Wyoming as a whole, and then we create initiatives and, and activities to address identified areas for improvement based off of that data. Um, we're right now in the process of creating a quality improvement report for each hospital based off of the data um, that I stated earlier. This report provides successes that each hospital has had, challenges, and suggested areas of focus for quality improvement in MBQIP. And so, um, you know, support for MBQIP is not just for keeping the, the CAH is eligible for flex funding. It's also to support the, the CAHs to provide quality care in the communities they serve. And that's my bid. Thanks so much, Michelle. We appreciate it. Uh, Karen, I'd like you to uh, join us again and talk about um, the importance that your program sees for supporting hospital financial performance. Um, sure. Th thanks again. Um, Again, I think this is one of those core competencies um, similar to understanding regulations and policies and, and quality improvement that was um, just discussed that really gets down to helping hospitals, um, helping individual hospitals at, at, at their level. Um, we've, we've been working in New York for a long time on helping our hospitals improve their financial and operational performance. And um, our current focus is um, we, is done that's done through our, our performance improvement network, which has a um, which has two work groups. One one is quality and one is financial and operational. Um, so that's the group where all the you know the CEOs and the CFOs come on a quarterly basis and and work with us to review their data. So that group measures the financial and operation financial and operational benchmarks that are that we that we all look at, the, the ones that are put forth in the, the Flex program guidance. Um, our group sets a network target and they compare qu quarterly data and discuss best practices based on the data um, in which hospitals have shown a large improvement or have been consistently strong. Unfortunately, um, we just had a meeting a week and a half ago and unfortunately probably like a lot of your hospitals are ours are still um, struggling in the, with financial and operational improvement. There, there have been some improvements, um, but they're still, you know, right kind of on that bubble. And um, coming together in our network, according to the evaluations they give us, has really helped them to um, make some improvements based on the discussions that they have with other hospitals. Um, the information that we received from the, from the Flex Monitoring team about about finance and operational performance is really good, and we share that with all of our hospitals um, when, when we receive it and um, work with them to, to help them determine how best to use it. But as everybody knows, that, that, that data is a little bit um, dated, and the data that we review in our quarterly meetings is, is the most recent that we have because it's submitted by um, each hospital the month preceding our meeting. So, they're really able to see their performance and how they're performing against their hospitals, both in New York and in the Northeast and nationally. And um, we're just hoping that we can continue to make help them make small improvements over time. Thanks so much, Karen. Caleb, could you join us again and, and tell us about your thoughts on uh, the competency of addressing community health needs? I'm here. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, so one of the 
I, th I think it's um, pretty well understood that there's a, a need for a hospital to to facilitate community health needs assessments beyond just the need for the um, to maintain their nonprofit status. Um, for for me as a flex coordinator, coordinator, it was great to to have access to those reports. Um, the a fair amount of the community health needs assessments were facilitated through another um, branch of our office. And when I went to try to engage a hospital in a quality improvement initiative, it was really beneficial for me to be able to review that community health needs assessment and connect or draw, draw connections between the needs that were identified during that community health needs assessment and what the hospital was going to do to improve upon their um, the health of their community and the quality improvement efforts that we were going to, um, or the, the projects that we were going to, to implement or, or do through the FLEX program. It also was very beneficial when I'm able to look at more than four of those across the state and impact or decide what what efforts we're going to do as the state office or with our other partner organizations as we talked about. So if, if you know, diabetic care or diabetic needs was not identified as a, as a high need in any of the areas with the community health needs assessments, but um, um, well, heart failure is pretty good here in Colorado, especially because of the altitude. If that was far and away a, a greater need than any in all diabetic care, then we probably would have focused a couple of our measures at the very least on heart failure, or you know, at least heart failure discharge instructions as opposed to just diabetic care. Um, so you're helping draw those connections for the community and for the hospital as well. So that was very beneficial. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah, I think that's and, most and, of what I have in my head anyway. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, and then for the remaining two core competencies, Sally Buck, the program director for TASC and CEO here at the center, is going to talk about her thoughts on the importance of, of the competencies. Thanks, Tracy. Understanding the systems of care, the, the next competency, and given the, the goals and roles of the FLEX program, it really is imperative that state FLEX programs and their partners understand the health system as a whole to participate in the discussions and planning and serving as that rural uh, voice uh, to ensure rural community needs are, are considered and representative. And systems thinking is crucial to understanding how these various health and social service providers can work together in rural communities to improve the overall health of populations. And the key proficiencies under, in understanding systems of care is maintaining an overall knowledge of the rural health landscape. And as a, in the FLEX program, it's important to understand that not only for your state, but also at the community or regional network level and then nationally and having um, relationships with the uh, state partners, as, as Caleb talked about earlier, is, is very critical. And then gathering information from those community uh, health needs assessments in terms of what's happening with access in your state. And then participating in, in learning opportunities. And as the country is transitioning uh, from volume to value, and we're seeing that emphasis from health and human service. There is quite a bit um, changing, and how that impacts rural is still being analyzed and, and discussed. And certainly, um, you know, we try to disseminate that information as much as possible. Also, the National Rural Health Association, the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health, American Hospital Association and the Centers um, for Medicaid Medicare Services. And there are other partners um, 
again, within, within your um, states, and then also um, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and the, there are different divisions and flex monitoring team that um, can help in understanding the changing environment. And then next one is looking at the interconnections um, of hospitals, clinics, and long-term care. And that's really important as those lines between primary care and um, tertiary care, long-term care, social services, as we look more at the social determinants of health, that the, those lines are um, interweaving more and more as there's care coordination and um, data sharing um, to look at um, quality outcomes and population health. And then the EMS, I mean, the, the EMS is a critical extension of rural health care teams and providing uh, pre-hospital care, working with emergency departments and, and then part of trauma and transfer teams and also now in care coordination and community um, health assessments. And then EMS, um, we have um, the JC RAC, um, which our organization is part of with the National Organization State Offices of Rural Health. And there's, you know, key factors in rural in terms of workforce and new models of um, paramedics working in community um, paramedicine. And then the incorporating behavioral mental health services was a, a, another proficiency noted um, as healthcare shifts to a value-based environment, um, there's more focus on the need for integration of um, behavioral health services and primary care and across that continuum. And again, significant access issues across the country in rural areas. And we often find with community health needs assessment that behavioral health access is often one of the top three priorities that uh, communities and, and hospitals identify, but it's so important in terms of health outcomes. And resources um, here can, in, again, include um, the Rural Health Innovation Hub, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, their community-based division, many of their network grants and um, small provider quality grants focus on behavioral health as well. And then collaborating with public health. Um, public health is a real important resource at the state level and to support uh, population health and quality improvement and often collaboration on, on data. And then the, the final competency is certainly not, as we said, we don't put these in order, <laughs> but you often think of the future last. Um, but I think it's at the forefront for many of us is looking at the future models of healthcare, and it's healthcare is undergoing um, transformative change. Um, this began with the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and, and now uh, newer initiatives under the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. So we're seeing that. Um, that goal that um, fee-for-service Medicare payments need to be tied to value and to quality, and that 50% of the payments will be in these alternative payment models by 2018, which is only uh, two years away. And so flex programs, I think, are, you know, are looked to for helping critical access hospitals in their communities um, understand this change, you know, and the education you're providing, the technical assistance, network support, and facilitating um, those new partnerships is important as they look at um, becoming part of uh, care teams and data sharing and um, the interoperability that's needed. So understanding these value-based reimbursement concepts um, Again, the important at your state level as your Medicaid pro Medicaid programs are probably changing uh, some more rapidly than others if they're in a state innovation model. Uh, your private payers are changing um, to more value-based care. 
And there are a number of resources here supported by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, including um, Rural Health Value, which has a lot of tools and um, best practices and models, a RUPRI, Flex Monitoring Team, and the RHI Hub, and again at the center, and what we've done, which we'll be showing you in a moment, is compiled resources in each of these core competencies um, to help you and then build that um, proficiency in um, the needed areas, but also to keep up on it, because I think this is one where it's just so um, changing so rapidly, and it's important that all of us um, support that application of the new models of care by discovering the best practices in our state, um, whether it's at um, a healthcare home involvement with a hospital, or accountable care organization, or community care organization, and how are rural facilities and organizations um, adapting to um, value-based and, and learning from their quality reporting and innovation, and share these best practices um, across the state. Great, thank you so much, Sally. And thank you to all of our speakers for not only participating in the summit, but also for sharing your thoughts today about the importance of the nine core competencies. So with the remainder of the call today, we're going to describe more about um, how we kind of package these competencies into a variety of different tools and resources for you to utilize. So on your screen um, is a listing of, of kind of the, the things that were created. So there's a guide, a core competencies for State Flex Program Excellence Guide a self-assessment, resources, as Sally mentioned, to support each of the nine core competencies, and then a web page as well. So what we're going to do now is share our screen so that we can walk through these resources and tools with you. Great. Thank you. So uh, hopefully you all can see our screen now. And this is the main landing page for the National Rural Health Resource Center. So the address is www.ruralcenter.org. And from this screen, which hopefully you have bookmarked, um, you can click on Program and then click on Task, the Technical Assistance and Services Center for the FLEX program. If you don't have this page bookmarked, I really suggest that you do because it um, shows you all the resources that are, that are created to support you in your role in the FLEX program. Over on the right side of the screen is a green navigation bar, and there's a new feature in here underneath Flex Program called Core Competencies. If you click on here, it takes you to the Core Competencies web page. And on this web page, it houses the link for the Core Competencies for State Flex Program Excellence Guide. Below that, the link to complete the self-assessment here in this green box, and then resources that are um, housed under separate resource libraries for each of the nine core competencies. So what we're going to start with is at the top here, um, the guide and, and kind of a, a walkthrough of what's in the guide. Um, I already have this open in a different screen, so I'm just going to open that instead. Um, so this is what the core competencies guide looks like on its, on its front cover. And in the table of contents, you'll see that it includes an overview, a purpose, um, um, sections for each of the nine core competencies and then concludes with recommendations in a conclusion paragraph and, and lastly it's followed by an appendix. Um, so a few things to highlight within the guide. Um, one is that we really strongly suggest that each state flex program takes the time to read through this guide in its entirety. Um, aside from um, those that are already in their position or those that have been in their position with the FLEX program for a long time, it's, it's a good resource for all of us, um, but it's also a great orientation material for, for those that are new to the FLEX program as you may be hiring them in now or in the future. And I think it will help them to understand the depth of your program and all the different aspects that, that you're trying to support. It's a, it's a hard program to describe to people, and I think that this can help um, lay that out for them. So. Excuse me as I scroll here, but there's the overview and talks about the purpose and, and how we went through the summit there, just like we've described on the webinar today. A little paragraph about what that web page is that I was just showing and um, some information about the assessment tool that we'll be explaining here shortly as well. So I'm going to scroll past there. 
and down into more of the, the meat of the guide, which then lays out each of the core competencies. They're, all nine of them are laid out the same way. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no hierarchy here. But within each of the core competencies, for example, this one managing the FLEX program, there is an introductory paragraph or a few paragraphs describing the importance of that competency and its relevance to FLEX. And then a bulleted list of the proficiencies um, for that competency. So for example, under managing the FLEX program, there are four proficiencies that contribute to excellence in that area. And all of the proficiencies are indicated in the guide by this um, badge icon you see here on the left side of the bulleted list. Those proficiencies are then explained in further detail um, following that. And then within each of the proficiency areas, you'll see some tips about that proficiency. So the first proficiency in managing the FLEX program is about managing the grant itself. So within the program, managing the grant. And then there are some tips on managing the grant. Those tips are then uh, indicated in this guide with this light bulb icon as well. And so the following nine proficiencies, or nine competencies, excuse me, are all kind of laid out the same way. An introductory paragraph about the importance of all of them, a listing of the proficiencies related to that competency indicated with a badge icon, um, descriptions of those proficiencies and kind of tips and things to know then that are indicated with a light bulb icon as well. Near the end of the, of the document, um, I'm going to scroll way down here, so sorry about that on your screen, um, is a list, like I said, of the recommendations that came out of the summit meeting. So these were suggested resources and tools and education that um, TASC and FRHP and other partners could consider developing to further support these competencies moving forward into the future, and then a conclusion statement as well. And at the very end of this guide is a list of resources. So there's some overview of um, kind of high-level resources, many of them pointing to partner organizations. And then there are listings of resources that we feel are are very applicable to each of the nine core competencies. So many of these resources are things that were have already been created over the years to support the FLEX program um, through TASC and other partners. Um, and some of them were other resources that we found elsewhere, including some of the state FLEX programs themselves. Um, they've all been cataloged now onto our website then to show up on that web page. So you can access any of these resources directly from this guide, or you can access the resources from the web page. So if I flip back to the web page here, this is the web page for the core competencies. Again, the link to the guide here at the top, the self-assessment, and down below are links to each of the core competencies and related resources. So if I choose, for example, building and sustaining partnerships and click on that, I enter into a page that provides me just a short description about what that competency and its proficiencies are. And below that, are a list of resources that are that are in the appendix for that guide, but are also kind of cataloged here onto the website. So this website, if you're familiar with our MBQIP website, is really similar, where the MBQIP resources are kind of structured into the different domains of MBQIP. These resources related to competencies are structured into the different competency areas. Um, resources that we feel are um, strongly suggested for each state flex program to review are pinned at the top with this little push pin icon to kind of float the list always, top of the list always of the resources that are relevant to that competency. So you could then, you know, click on say this community toolbox if you wanted to review that and it'll take you directly to that resource. You can also search, search within the resources um, for um, things that might be a word that you might be looking for. So if you wanted to look for the word say stakeholder, and apply that, it will bring up a list of any resources that had the word stakeholder, and apparently there wasn't a word stakeholder there, or I typed it wrong. But in essence, that essentially is what it does, is it searches within that competency component then for that area. You can um, navigate as well around in this core competency webpage from the menu on the right side here, too. So this is the area I'm in, indicated with this dark black font. If I wanted to go back to the main core competencies page, I could just navigate to that, and it takes me back to the start. Um, uh, so 
with that, I think I'm going to turn things over to Sarah Brinkman now, who's going to talk to you about the self-assessment. All right, great. So as Tracy pointed out on this front page, if you scroll, the, the kind of middle option here is to complete the self-assessment. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. So the first thing to note about the self-assessment is that you, if you happen to be logged into your forum account, you'll see this notification in red at the top of the page, which is encouraging you to log out before you complete the assessment. The results from the assessment will be sent to you via email with a unique link to view the results in your web browser. And if you're logged in at the time of completion, the link will only work when you're logged into the website. But if you're logged out, anyone you provide the link to will be able to access the results. So that's why we really encourage you to log out. That's why this notice pops up here. So I'll just go ahead and log out simply by clicking the log out link and it will redirect me to the page automatically. So there's, it's just that simple. If you weren't logged in at the time that you accessed this, this is what the page will look like automatically. So uh, the beginning of this page is some narrative that we encourage you to read before you complete the assessment. We talked a little bit about the background of the program. The purpose of this assessment um, is that TASC and F4HP are encouraging state flex programs to use the assessment as a means to identify areas of strength and opportunity within your programs. And it's not intended, again, to reflect the competence of an individual staff person or even staff only internal to the organization, but rather the state flex program as a whole, including external and um, part, external partners and contractors. So as we scroll down, there is then uh, some suggestions about when you should complete the assessment. F4HP encourages programs to complete the assessment at least annually and to use the results to monitor progress and aid in strategic planning. Programs receiving a site visit from TASC or sending participants to the FLEX workshop will be asked to complete the assessment ahead of time, and those results will be used by TASC to inform agendas and technical assistance provision at those events. Uh, it's important to note that the results of the assessment will not be used by F4HP to determine future funding levels. In fact, individualized results will not be shared with F4HP without express consent of the completing organization. Results will be emailed to whoever completes the assessment and shared with TASC, and TASC will share blinded results with F4HP to inform work plan and broad technical assistance services. Um, so as we scroll down here, uh, when it, if we get to the section about who should complete the assessment, remember again that it's not meant to reflect uh, an individual person, it's meant to reflect the program as a whole. So you may wish to complete the assessment as a team, or you could choose to appoint someone highly familiar with the program to complete it on the program's behalf. And then complete the assessment, we're going to walk through that real, quick, real quickly here. Uh, we do encourage you to review the guide prior to completing the assessment as it provides more information and background on the meaning and importance of each of the competencies. So throughout the assessment, you'll be asked to rate your program's level of competence on a scale of one to five, one being little to no competence and five being highly competent on each of the proficiencies that's detailed in the guide. So for example, this first competency is managing the FLEX program. And so you're asked to rate the program's competence as it relates to each of these proficiencies, managing the grants, managing contract, contracts and consulting services, continuously assessing the program, and regularly reporting grant progress. Then for each competency area, you'll be asked to indicate if the proficiencies are met through internal or external resources, and then identify the person or people with primary knowledge or expertise in that competency area. This same framework repeats over again for each of the nine competencies. So as you scroll down, you'll see it, it looks similar throughout. At the end of the assessment, so we'll just scroll to the end here, this is where you'll be asked for contact information and details. So the first question is indicating if you would like to be contacted by task and follow up to receive individualized technical assistance. As Tracy pointed out, the resources are organized so that you're able to access them easily, but we are available to provide you individualized technical assistance if you, upon completion, would like someone to reach out and point out some particular resources based on your results that we think might be helpful. Um, and 
you uh, will also be using those, as we mentioned, in um, connection to any site visits or uh, participants at the FLEX workshop. All of the questions in the assessment do require an answer, so if you were to go through the assessment and try to submit, you will be prompted to go back and answer if there were any that you missed, so make sure that you, that you do that. Uh, upon completion, you'll be, uh, I have a, a, a mock completed assessment here for us to look at. Uh, so you'll be, when you click submit, you'll automatically be taken to a new web page. And at the top right, you'll see your organization score. And this is a sum of the averages of each competency area. So each competency has a potential score of five and the total possible score is 45. As you scroll down, you'll see your average score for each competency area, and then also the narrative that you provided uh, indicating if the competency was met internally or externally and who the key personnel are. So for, for in this example, uh, in the faux survey, I got a four point, or the assessment got a 4.5 in managing the FLEX program. Uh, when you are redirected to this page, this URL is a unique URL that you can save. You'll also be sent an email, and this is an example of what the email would look like. So the email contains the information that you provided, but it's not in a very user-friendly uh, format. We do encourage you to use the link that's provided here. It's the same link as the web page that you're redirected to when you submit. And you can share that link with others in your internal to your organization or partners as you see fit. So we suggest that when you're reviewing these, when you're, you're reviewing your results, that you prioritize focus areas for improvement based on your scores first against across the nine competencies, and then consider scores for the individual proficiencies. And any competencies in which your program scores a three or lower should be considered areas of focus for improvement. The resources identified for each of those competency areas are a great place to start on that journey towards improvement. As long as you are logged out of the website when you complete the assessment, anyone that has that link will be able to access the results and you can share them again as you see fit. We also would encourage you to maintain a list of all of the URLs of your completed assessments for monitoring purposes so that over time you can see how your program is progressing in the various areas. And I think with that, we're open for questions. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes remaining on the webinar. So if you have any questions, um, you can either type them into the chat box or it's 